let's, um, I think we'll start for real in uh, about a minute, but let's start with any questions or issues that came up from the first lecture. Uh, any comments or questions about how the grading is going to be done or how the course is going to be organized or any questions about anything that any of the material we talked about last time. Yes? I, I want to know uh, about how many people to form a group. Okay, so how many people to form a group? Um, so I guess I would say it depends upon what group we're talking about. So presumably what we're talking about is on the presentation slash projects. Yes. That was where we talk about groups. And I am typically interested in groups of the order of, let's say, two people-ish, okay? So for presentations, two people uh, are probably about the right amount. Um, there were four people who volunteered for the rapid response team. They responded rapidly. And uh, so I have them on their uh, list. Um, and I'm right now trying to get some data accounts for them. So if you've signed up on the list, you haven't been forgotten. Um, and I think for the, I'm willing to start with four people on that. So basically I would say try to think about two people in a group. I would consider there being three people if there is a good reason, okay, um, in general, okay? Does that sound fair? Okay, um, so the, the group people, the, 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 the issue with groups to keep in mind would probably be with respect to the, uh, right now for the presentations. I list material for about seven presentations, okay? And so if you look at the syllabus and you're interested in one of those subjects, I encourage you to find a group partner and uh, come to me and uh, say, we want to present this, okay? Any questions? There will be other projects and things like that a little later, but uh, that's my vision, okay? So two, maybe three people if you have a reason. Any questions? Okay? Any other questions about the course organization or layout or any of the material we talked about last time? Okay. Um, fair enough. Um, some people, have anybody tried to look up the notes on the, on the, the web to see that the, to read it there? Okay. The notes, I'm putting the lecture notes on the web when I have them. I work on them possibly up to the minute of lecture, so they might change a little bit before the lecture, and then after the lecture, I'll just fix typos, okay? But, um, but uh, any questions about that? Okay, so the other thing I'd like to do, just again, as preliminary things, in case there's some new people who may not have been here the first time, I want to pass out this sign-up sheet just to make sure I know who every person in the room is. So um, if you signed this last time, do not sign it again. It's not an attendance sheet, it's just to make sure that it's just a, a roster so I know everybody who's here and why they're here. Okay, so let me uh, go and pass that out here. Yeah, start circulating. Okay, any other questions before we get further? Okay, so last time we started very, very briefly <clears throat> talking about the concept of bonds and bond markets and things like that. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about that because it's a, uh, you know, it's a big subject. And, um, and and it gets into the idea of trading contracts, which is kind of a funny idea. So what is the bond? A bond, a bond is a loan, is a way to think about it. Okay? It's an agreement somehow, a contract that one party will pay a certain amount of money to another party. Okay? And um, that contract is specified by party A is going to pay party B a stream of payments that according to a schedule, I will pay you X amount at time one, I will spend you, spend you Y amount at time two, and so on, okay? And that's what a bond is. It's a contract for a specification of payment. Now, um, if you own one of these bonds, one thing you can do is wait for this other party to pay you the money, right? They have agreed to pay you money. One possibility is you sit there back and you wait for them to pay you. That's sort of the way banks used to work, okay, um, is they would make a loan and wait for you to pay it back, okay? And of course, they had to figure out what was the right payment schedule so that they would make a profit on the deal in the long run. That was sort of the, 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 the important thing. Any questions? Now in a world where you could actually trade these contracts, trade these bonds, 
that increases the value of having made this loan. I could, if I want, sit back and wait for the stream of payments to come from you. Or I could sell it to somebody else. Okay? And this extra freedom, by definition, only increases my value. This liquidity, the fact that I can trade it, is a good thing for me. Okay? And um, so there are active markets where people trade bonds back and forth, trade these loans back and forth. Okay? Any questions about that concept? Yes? Uh, how do I price the bond? How do I price the bond? We will talk about a little bit how we price bonds. Uh, in fact, I'll talk about, give you concrete examples in a few minutes of two bonds that we can price. Okay? But let's think about what the factors are that are important. Clearly, the value of the bond should depend upon several different things. One is it depends upon the, the term, the length of time till I get my money. Okay? It will depend upon the interest rate. You are paying me, first of all, you, you, you're paying me streams of cash. That's what we've agreed to. Okay? Part of the price is going to depend upon what the rate of interest is. How much, basically, you're paying me, um, well, there's a couple ways that we can think about interest rates, which will be clearer when we look at the real pricing of it. But there's a question of what the going rate is for people borrowing money. And that's one way to factor affecting the, the value of this loan. Another thing that's going to be affecting it is the strength of the borrowing party. If I am waiting for streams from you and you are about to go to prison, okay, presumably that loan is worth less, right? I am less certain of getting the payments that you promised me, okay? And so we would expect that the value of the bond would drop. Does that make sense? No matter how strong the party is, the best I can hope for is they make the payments that they promise. If the party is weak, they might not make, keep their promises. Okay? And the more likely they're, they're not going to keep their promises, the lower the price should be. Okay? So these are the kind of factors that would go into pricing bonds, okay, as a general rule. Any questions about that? Okay? And as we talk about bond markets, one other thing that will affect it is sort of what you can, what the returns are from other investments. If I can get, let's say, a 5% interest from this bond that, uh, that, that, um, you know, that, 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 that we've already decided, but there's a stock out there that will pay me 10% interest with, let's say, the same amount of risk, I am going to be less interested in your bond. Does that make sense? And so there's also going to be these other factors that are really factored into the interest rate that will occur. Any questions? So the most important, let's say, principle underlying how you price what a bond is has to do with a concept called the time value of money. Okay? And this is an important concept and idea. Okay? It states basically that a dollar bill tomorrow is worth less than a dollar bill today, okay? And um, in fact, what it really says is, it has to do with, um, somehow when we talk about what the value of an asset is after a particular amount of years, okay, we have to understand how basically interest works. You know that basically you can take money and put it in a bank, and the banks here will pay you interest. Is that true with the banks here? Okay, I assume that that's true, right? Does everybody understand that? What are the interest rates your banks pay? Does anybody have a bank account that pays interest? Yeah? 3%. 3%, okay. So what does it mean when it says that they are paying you 3%? You have put your entire wealth into a bank, okay, which let's say is $100. Okay, hopefully it's more than that. But let's, let's say it's that, okay? What is the bank going to give you a year from now? Okay? If they are paying 3% interest, what does that mean? What they're really going to be doing, the simplest way to think about it, if they are promising you 3% per year, a year from now, you're going to still have your original capital. Plus, they're going to give you another 3%. Okay? And what they're really going to be doing is multiplying your original capital by 1 plus the interest rate. 
okay, or in this case 1.03 percent, 1.03 times 100. Does everybody see that? That the, your $100 today would, by this simple measure of interest, be equal to $103 a year from now, okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Any questions? Okay? So do, to be precise, if you want to calculate what the value is, okay, of how much money you will have, or the value of an asset in n years, okay, after you compound it, okay, by doing the interest year after year, well, let's, let's, let's think about this a little bit. A year from now, you've got $103. Does everybody agree with that? Now, what happens if you leave it in the bank for another year? How much interest will you get from the bank? Okay? Is it $3 or more than $3? More than $3. Why is that? It's because you're earning interest on your interest. Is that clear? You get the $3 from that original 100, let's say, but you're also getting the interest on the $3 that you have earned, right? So after two years, if you're paid once a year, okay, at the end of the year, you would be having your original amount of 100 times the compounding raised to the number of years. You multiply the whole amount by another 1.3. 0 0.03, okay? Any questions about that? So simple annual interest, okay, like we're talking about it now, okay, is a world where you are being paid for n years. Right now we're talking about compounding once per year, Okay, that was the, the world of this, that, uh, the simple model I'm talking about, where at the end of the year they give you your 3%. Okay? So there, M was equal to 1. This formula is that the value of it after N years was the original price times 1 plus the interest rate to the number of years. Does everybody see that? Now, more generally, they don't have to pay you the interest. They might not pay you the interest after, at the end of the year. Perhaps they will pay you the interest every quarter. Okay? So they'll pay you one-fourth of your year's interest at the beginning, at the end of the first quarter. Then they'll pay the interest again at the same rate over the next quarter. That would correspond to here the number of periods being M equals four per year. Is it better for you if they pay you the interest more than, more than once a year? Why is that better for you? Because you're earning interest on the interest. Is that right? The moment they just slide some money into your account, that money is earning interest. So in some sense, the quicker you get it, the better off you are. Does that make sense? Okay. So the formula here is that if they give it to you over an annual interest rate of R, if they give it to you at n periods, okay, per year, the value is A, di a times 1 plus the, month that the rate per period raised to the total number of periods, which is the number of years times the periods per year, okay? And in the limiting case, okay, They'll give you the interest the instant that it's earned. Every millisecond, your money is earning interest. If they give you that interest every millisecond, okay, that's the best possible situation for you. Okay, millisecond, microsecond, every infinitesimally small time period. What is the value of this as the number of periods goes to infinity? Okay, you'll remember Somewhere along the line, when you took calculus, there was a funny expression. One plus one over n raised to the n. What is the value of this? E, okay? The way I think about it is, again, as n gets bigger, 
This thing inside gets closer and closer to 1, right? As n gets bigger, multiplying something bigger than 1 should get bigger. And they're fighting with each other as n gets bigger. And somehow they, what ends up working out is e. Does everybody remember that? e equals 2.718 dot dot dot, right? So in the case of continuous compounding, it turns out that the value that you have after n years is basically the original price times e to the rn. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, when in computer science do we hear the word exponential growth? Anyone in any class or any class you took where people talked about things growing exponentially? Which class was it? Algorithms. So what was it that grew algor ex exponentially? Sometimes running times, right? And was that good or bad that they grew exponentially? Bad. Okay. Here we have something else growing exponentially. It is money. Okay? Is money growing exponentially good or bad? Good. Good. Okay? The problem with running times growing exponentially is that they grow very fast, right? In principle, exponential growth of money, okay, is good. That means that your money, you put it in the bank, it will in principle grow very fast. Okay? It will grow exponentially. As exponentially as any search algorithm that you use, you know, exhaustive search algorithm you use for an empty complete problem, that kind of thing. Any questions about that? Now, um, this basic principle that we're talking about called the time value of money is really one of the fundamental things governing how the world works. The idea that, it, that money in the future is worth less. Well, let's just think about it. it one way to think about it is that, um, that money grows exponentially. The other way to think of it, though, is if you think about it, who's better off? You, keep with the money that you put in the bank, or the bank, is anybody better off? Is anybody getting the better of the other party? Okay? The answer is really no. Okay? You're walking to put your money into the bank freely, correct? The bank is not resisting it. The bank is not holding a gun to your head, right? So somehow the deal that you put your money into the bank and get that interest rate, is seemingly a fair thing. Okay? That makes sense? Now, if the total amount of money a year from now is grown exponentially, somehow that amount of money must in principle be equal to what you paid on some cosmic scale of fairness or else you wouldn't do that kind of a deal. Okay? So the upshot here is that money in the future is worth less than money it is today. The same amount of money Okay, a fixed dollar is worth less a year from now than it is today. And it's worth less two years from now than it is one year from now. Any questions about that? And this is kind of a fixed principle of the world. One of my favorite cartoons, which unfortunately I couldn't find on the internet or I would have put on the slide, had this thing where, Al where Einstein, a picture of Einstein at a blackboard, working out this complicated derivation. And in the end, it ends up like this. And the caption said, Einstein proves that time is money. Okay? And uh, that's sort of the basic principle here. Any questions about what the idea of time value of money, what I mean by it? Okay? Any questions? Okay, so let's look now. You wanted to price a bond, let's say. Let's price a very, very interesting kind of a bond. Okay? It is going to be a security where you go to the bank and they, you buy a security that will pay you $1 per year forever. Okay? You go to the bank, you buy this thing, at the end of the year they'll send you a check for a dollar, a year from now they'll send you a check for a dollar, two years from now they'll send you a check for a dollar, a million years from now they will send you a check for a dollar, and so on forever. Does everybody get an idea what the security is? It's providing a stream of $1 bills every year infinitely. So how many total dollars will you create, collect? An infinite amount of dollars, okay? What would you pay for this security? Let's think about it. Let's actually, before we just go ahead, everybody's actually priced it, okay? 
What would you pay for a security that gives you one dollar a year infinitely? Okay. Is it an infinite amount? Okay. How can we sort of price what something like that is worth? Okay. What we can think about is, if I want to buy this thing now, I'm going to be getting a stream of dollar bills with time. Okay? The first dollar bill, if I get it today, is worth a dollar. That I agree with. Okay? The dollar bill I get a year from now, okay, is that going to be worth a dollar in today's money? Okay? It's going to be worth less than a dollar's worth of mo today's money, right? But how much less? Okay? Is there a precise way we can quantify how much that dollar a year from now is worth? Any ideas? Okay. One thing we could ask ourselves is, how much money do we put in the bank now such that a year from now it would give us a dollar? Does that make sense? Is that a way to price what a dollar a year from now is worth? Okay. It's worth how much money I could put in today in the bank so that I have a dollar a year from now. Is that amount going to be more or less than a dollar? Well, it's got to be less than a dollar, right? Because it's got to have the interest on this the amount of money. Let's say I put this amount of money, I'm going to call it V2. If I put V2 dollars in the bank now, I want it to be worth a dollar a year from now, right? Suppose the interest rate is R, okay? How much money do I have to put in the bank so I have a dollar a year from now? Okay? I claim, does everybody see that? I claim that if I had V2 dollars in the bank now, a year from now I will have my original capital plus Basically, the interest rate times my original investment, right? A year from now, I will have one plus the interest rate. Okay? I want that to be equal to one dollar. Solving for the value of V1, you see the equation V2 times one plus the interest rate equals one dollar. Solving for that, that tells me how much money do I need in the bank. Okay? I, that will tell me what the value of the second year's dollar is. Any questions about it? How many people see what I mean by this now? How many people are understanding it? And how many people are confused? Question like, I don't get it, is a good question. Okay? So this says that the value of the, that of, of, of the second year dollar now is 1 over 1 plus the interest rate in annual compounding. Okay? And again, by just using the compound, uh, you know, continuous compounded formula. We could price what it is there. Okay? Any questions? Notice that the interest rate, you said you're getting 3%. That means 1 over 1.03. It's a little less than 1. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, why is the uh, value of the value of the value of the value of the value Because, uh, in the real world, maybe even different banks have different Maybe if we uh, put our money in the stock market or in, in the foundation, also uh, in our Okay, so you're saying what is the value of the interest rate? I am saying that, that, that there is some interest rate R that is the interest rate. And you're telling me interest rates are a complicated thing. Yeah. Okay? And I will agree, interest rates are a complicated thing. But what I'm going to say here is this is an interest rate that someone's willing to give you forever. Okay? So somehow you strike the best deal you can, that's what R is. You're trying to value, what was the whole point of this thing? You're trying to value what is it, what should you pay for this thing that is going to give you streamers of payments at one dollar a year, right? R is what is the interest rate you can get on it, it seems to me. If you're trying to value it, it's a question of what value of interest rate you can get. Okay? Any questions? Okay? So, 
In general, what is the situation? The value of the amount of money we need to put in the bank now to cover the nth year, okay, is basically VM. We need it so that if we do n years of compounding on that amount, at that point we get um, one dollar, and VM is going to be equal to this. Notice that the value of the dollar you're getting in the e in the nth year is declining exponentially with the value of n. M, does that make sense? Okay. Now then, we know how much the value of the dollar that we're getting in the first through every year is. What is the total value of this security? Okay. It is the sum of the amounts that we pay for it. Okay. If we look at this thing, this is an exponential series, an exponentially decreasing series. Okay? The sum of this is governed by this formula you learned before. Okay? Summing up the value of this as m goes from 0 to infinity is 1 over 1 minus this or 1 over r. Okay? And so one interesting thing that's kind of surprising is, if let's say there's an interest rate of 5%, the value of an infinite annuity is only $20. To yield an infinite stream of dollar bills for the rest of the, the exist, for the rest of forever. Okay? Even though you're getting an infinite series of dollars, it would only be worth $20 for this annuity. Any questions on how we priced it? How people sort of get it. Okay? Now, how do people think an infinite annuity is a silly thing? Okay? In fact, actually, I think many, most of the people in this room will buy an infinite annuity in the course of your life. What would be an example of an infinite annuity you might want to have? Okay? Again, I, you know, I, I may not completely understand local retirement considerations. But at some point, you're going to retire. Okay? Hopefully after you take this class, you have a good career, you earn some money, you're now going to retire. And you're going to need a stream of payments for the rest of your life. What is one way that you can guarantee yourself a stream of payments for the rest of your life? Is if you buy an infinite annuity like this. Does that make sense? That way you will get a certain amount of money every year. If you don't buy something like this, you're gambling on how long you're going to live, okay? Also, your money might run out early. Does that make sense? Okay? Any questions about how we price this? Okay? Any questions? Okay. Let me look at one other... Um, now, now, these financial calculations, in one sense, are nothing more than arithmetic, okay? But it's kind of important. It was a question, how do you price one of these bonds? In some sense, it, it, it's calculations like this that will determine the price of a relatively simple bond. Now, another type of bond that you will probably encounter in the course of your life, or at least in the United States people encounter, and I trust you may do it too, is the equivalent of a fixed rate loan. Okay? In the United, you know, when I buy a house in the United States, I need a large chunk of money from the bank to pay for a house. I will go to the bank and I say, I want to borrow X number of hundred thousand dollars. Okay? They will tell me what the interest rate is. We will agree on how many years I will borrow, borrow the money for, typically 30. Okay? And we will structure a, thing, a, a way so that I pay a fixed amount of money per month. And at the end of 30 years, the bank and I are completely settled. Okay? Does anybody, are there similar kinds of arrangements here? I don't know if it's with houses. Do anybody who buy cars? Okay? Cars probably also have this property. That you want to pay a fixed amount of money for the car each month. Okay? How do they price what that should be worth? Okay? The basic principle of a mortgage is that when the bank loans me money, 
at an interest rate, I am going to pay them a stream of payments. For this to be a fair deal, okay, the present value of all the payments I'm going to give has to equal the value of the principal that I borrowed. Okay? Now I'm going to be paying money in the future. Those dollars are worth less. In order for the bank to be happy with this deal, okay, I have to pay them back more total dollars than I borrowed. That's the principal plus the interest. Okay? But, okay, the present value of what I pay them has to be equal to what I borrow. Any questions about that? Do people agree with that's a fair principle in pricing it? Okay? So now, we don't care about an infinite series. We only care about the first n terms of a geometric series, right? Because I'm only going to be paying for m time periods. The number of time periods, if I'm making monthly payments, is 12 times the number of years. Okay? I want to pay a fixed amount of X, okay, dollars every month for 12 times Y months. Correct? That's the kind of structure that I want to do. So how much should I be paying? The present value of the loan on one side is L because that's how much the bank is giving me, right? This moment they're giving me L dollars. For the bank to be happy with it, they need to know that the value of my monthly payment each top month, the sum of all those payments equals this in terms of present value. That's X times, for each month I'm paying them X, but the value of that is discounted exponentially, okay? according to the same formula that we looked at before. And so solving for x gives me, okay, what the value of my monthly payment is. Any questions about that? How many people see this? Yes, question. question. Is r less than zero? Is r less than zero? r had better not be less than zero, okay? Because I, I figure out in the formula that r must be less than zero. Let's figure this thing out now. Wait a second. So you think that R should be less than zero? If the equation holds. That certainly seems re Okay, so we sort of agree that, okay, let, I think that maybe this is supposed to be a plus. That's a good thing to catch. Let's think about this. It's the same basic principle as before, okay? In that, every month, the value of this should be decaying. So this has to be getting smaller. If R is, um, so this value had better be, let's think about this, okay? 1 minus R, okay, 1 over 1 plus R, okay, is going to be, um, if it was a plus, this is going to then be less than 1, right? Less than 1 raised to a power gets more and more less than 1, right? So I do believe the answer is this should be a plus, presumably the same way that it was on um, the other notes. Okay, I think if we had it a plus on the other side, right? Yes, okay, same basic principle. So you're right, thank you for catching that. Okay, any questions? Okay, and based on this, you can now price what the monthly mortgage is. Any questions? So, um, I mean, how many people, is there anybody here who has actually paid, uh, uh, bar borrowed money at a fixed rate per month to pay it back? See, one person buying a house I know is, ha is. None of you other guys have, okay? Someday, hopefully in your lives you will, but if not, it seems like a reasonable enough pro concept. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Now, sometimes you hear the word amortization. Has anybody ever heard the word amortize, amortization? Okay. When people hear the word, I find it an interesting word because of the derivation. The interesting word is the word mort, mortality, mortgage, okay? Mort, mort has to do with killing, okay? Death, dying, mortality, okay? When people talk about amortization, they mean killing the loan, the rate at which they're paying back their principal. What's interesting is, if you take a look at what's happening when you're paying a mortgage, Okay? 
Every month you're making a fixed amount of payment. Okay? Some of that money is going to the bank for interest, and some of that money is going to the, um, what you call it, to, to pay off the balance of what you owe the bank. Does everybody agree with that? At the end of, at the beginning of the mortgage, <clears throat> should you be paying mostly interest or mostly principal? Principal. Mostly interest. Okay, well, let's, maybe it's easier to think about the last payment. <laughs> the last payment in the, that you're making, okay? Should that represent interest or principal? Well, if we think that the value of a loan, okay, is at the present value of the payments, okay? If you're paying, about to make the last payment on the loan, now the present value of this is pretty much exactly what it is now, correct? So the present value of the last thing, it, it, it's not fair that the last loan mortgage payment be interest. If we define that the, the, the value of the mortgage, the amount that you owe is the present value of the payments to come in, that last payment had better be all principal for this to make sense. How many people agree with that? No, but how many people don't understand what I'm saying? Okay, a few of you. Good. Okay, good because I, I want need, need to hear this kind of feedback. Okay? But again, the way to price what the value of a loan is, okay, is we've defined the value of a loan. Okay, the pre the, 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 that if you have borrowed a certain amount of money L, the, 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 pre the present value of the, the, the payments that you get has got to be equal to L, right? As time goes by, you're paying some money to the bank to pay off your loan and some to interest to satisfy them, correct? And so as time goes by, the amount that you owe should decrease. But this basic principle should still be the case, that the present value of the remaining stream of payments, okay, should equal the, the amount that you still owe. And if you accept that principle, then certainly for the last payment, you're paying them $100 in the last payment the present value of that dollar, since I'm, about, I'm going there ready to give you the check, is a real hundred dollars. So it's got to all be principal at that point. And so if you work backwards and you think about this a little bit, at the beginning almost everything is interest. At the end almost everything is um, principal. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes? I can see that two words. You can't see the words? Okay, well basically, um, this says basically, this is supposed to represent how much of the, a way to think of this is the, the bar as we move through this thing. Each month you're paying a fixed amount of money. This is showing the partition into interest is the area under this curve, and principal is the area above that curve. Okay? So as we slide through time, Okay, the proportion of it that is interest is originally all of it, and at the end is essentially none of it. Okay, any questions? Okay, any questions about the mortgage bond? Now, let's just think about this as a bond again. Okay, I have had an agreement with the bank, okay, where the bank has loaned me some money, and I will pay them some streams, a stream of payments, right? You might want to buy this payment stream from the bank, or the bank might want to sell it. Selling this loan would be selling a bond, right? What would be the value of this bond? Would you want to buy it? What would be if, if you want, let's say, again, we see Mordecai, he's about to take out a mortgage, okay? The bank, Mordecai Bank might want to sell that bond, that, that loan that it made, right? What is the value of this bond and how might we price it? What does it depend on? 
Okay? It depends upon certainly the stream of payments that are still expected to come from the mortgage, right? Okay? It also depends upon the value of the current interest rate. Okay? Because once we've made an agreement as to how much Mordechai the person is paying in the loan, there was an agreement of those payments that schedule of payments was a function of the interest rate that the bank and, and the borrower had agreed on. Over time, the interest rates might change. Does that make sense? Let's say that I agree, Mordecai makes a deal with the bank. The bank will loan him money at 5%. Okay? Suddenly, after he's made that agreement, interest rates go up to 10%. Mordecai's stream of payments, okay, are worth less now than they were before. Does that make sense? Okay. So the value of this stream is a function of the payment schedule, the current interest rate, and finally the trustworthy of the borrower. Uh, of the borrower. We need to know, is Mordecai actually going to pay the thing? Okay? Mordecai gets fired, the value of the bond drops. Okay? Because he's less likely to make the payments. Any questions about that? Okay? So at least this should give you a qualitative sense as to some of the issues that go on in pricing these things. Any questions about it? Okay? Any questions about how these things get prices? Okay? Okay, there are other markets as well, okay, where um, you can trade things and that are financial markets. One of the important ones that you hear about a lot now are commodity markets, okay? What is a commodity? Actually, sometimes in people, in, you, when you, in the popular press, what does it mean for something to be a, a commodity, okay? I don't, mean, I don't know what you read in the way of, of, of newspapers or technology services, but sometimes you might say that uh, the ability to, you know, buying a com computer today is a commodity. I don't know if anyone's ever heard this thing. What does commodity mean in this context? It somehow means something that one of them is about the same as the other. Okay? That they're somehow interchangeable goods. Okay? Maybe that example isn't so clear. But basically, when people talk about a commodity, a commodity is a type of a good that is indistinguishable in terms of quality. Okay? Um, for example, orange juice. If you define a standard of quality of orange juice, you go to the parking shop downstairs. There are two bottles of orange juice. Is there any difference between the two bottles of orange juice? Okay? There should not be a difference between the bottles of orange juice, right? It doesn't matter which one of them you buy, okay? They both have, have two liters of orange juice in them. They both cost the same amount. They both should cost the same amount because they are interchangeable goods. They are commodities, right? An ounce of gold that he has should be worth as much as an ounce of gold that you have, okay? Why is it? That's because gold is a commodity, okay? So long as it has a certain standard of quality and weight, that gold is going to be worth the same amount as his gold. Everybody see that? One interesting thing is that there's lots of things on the market that people can trade, okay? And make commodities because they are defined to be such. Sometimes, you know, in the United States, the classic commodity is pork bellies. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that term before, okay? But you can go and buy a contract on a commodity market, um, platform for 5,000 pork bellies, okay? Now, why, how can you buy these things? Well, it's basically on the idea that they have defined what a pig is, okay, sufficiently accurately that one pig is interchangeable with another and that when you buy 5,000 pigs, they, they are all of the same quality, okay, of defined quality, okay? Once you have a definition of indistinguishable things, 
You can now trade contracts on the ability to deliver these things before they actually exist. This is actually kind of an interesting thing to say. I can agree to buy 5,000 pork bellies a year from now because we have a definition of what a pork belly is. It comes from a pig who's 20 kilos to 50 to 23 kilos. That's healthy, that you know, you know, looks nice, okay? And once we have a definition, we can now have a contract, okay, to trade them even before they are produced, okay? This is kind of an interesting idea, okay? And so what commodities markets do, they exist the ability to trade these products, not only now, but even trade them in the future. Perhaps I am planning a very, very big picnic a year from now, and I know I'm going to need 5,000 pork bellies, okay? If I could perhaps buy, figure out what the price is now, I might come to an agreement now, okay? So I know how much that was going to cost me a year from now. If I am concerned about the price of the food at that picnic, I might want to buy some kind of a contract for future delivery of these things, okay? And so a commodity future is basically an agreement to buy or sell a specified amount of a specified commodity at a specified price at a specified time in the future, okay? And this commodity future is a contract depending upon how the price of pork bellies changes in the interim, okay? The value of this contract is either going to go up or down because it's an agreement. You agreed to sell me 5,000 pork bellies for $10,000, okay, a year from now. If suddenly there's a big population explosion of pigs and the price of pork drops, I've already agreed to pay this amount okay the person who sold it to me did, did a good thing because they got a fixed price for the pigs before they dro the price dropped right on the other hand if pigs become an endangered species okay and the price becomes very valuable per pig okay then the seller is in trouble okay the seller is past you know it's going to cost the seller a lot to satisfy that contract any questions about how these things basically work okay we will sometimes use the word spot price to denote the cost of buying a good now, where we'll also sometimes talk about the future price, which is the price we would pay, uh, the, 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 the price we can guarantee if we want the thing in the future. Any questions about it? When you read news reports, do you ever hear the word spot price in the news? I don't know if anybody listens to the news or anything like that. Is there any commodity that's in the news these days where they seem to talk every day about what the spot price of it is? Oil, right? Everyone is concerned about the spot price of oil. That is what it will cost to get a barrel of oil today. Okay? And in fact, if you read these things carefully, it's not just a barrel of oil. They will quote you as uh, a, because there's good oil and there's bad oil. Okay? You will often see that they will say it is the spot price for a barrel of sweet light crude is $113.56 today. That is how much it would cost to buy it for today's delivery. Okay? The commodities market's worrying about what if you want to price it for future deliveries. Any questions? Okay? So why? Do they have these future contracts? Any questions about what future contracts are? Commodities, future contracts. Okay? Why is it that, um, that, that, that these exist in a philosophical way? The good thing about um, commodities futures is they give a way for both suppliers and consumers to protect themselves against changes in prices, to hedge risk, that's really what the idea here is. If you are a farmer, okay, farmers, again, at least in the United States, always seem to be suffering, okay? Their, their life is very uncertain. If there is a, you know, there's a big hurricane in, that, that just passed through the southern part of the United States, there are a bunch of unhappy farmers 
okay, who lost their crops now, right? Sometimes there is oversupply, okay? Everybody's crops are good and the price drops very low. It might be that a farmer might want to lock in a price for the corn that they grow now, okay? If so, what would the farmer do? The farmer could sell a futures contract. Say, I will sell you 5,000 pounds, 5,000 bushels of number two corn for a certain amount of money with delivery in September 2009, okay? If so, they have locked in a future price, okay? And now their risk about flat price fluctuations is gone, okay? They don't have to worry about what's going to happen in the corn market, okay? Any questions? So that's a good thing. If you are an airline, the airlines now are having big problems. I don't know if anybody reads in the news, why are airlines having a big problem? It's not that the seats on the plane aren't full, okay? What is the problem for the airlines? Oil prices. Oil prices. The fuel prices are very high. The oil, when I bought my ticket here, okay, Cathay Pacific shipped me here for a certain amount of money. They didn't realize that the price of oil was going to increase in the time that between when I bought the ticket and not, okay? So what an airline might want to do to protect itself against the, the fluctuation of oil prices is to say, I will buy oil a year from now. I agree I will buy a certain amount of oil a year from now at a fixed price, okay? If oil prices go up, I feel smart. If oil prices go down, I feel dumb. But most of all, I feel relaxed because the problem of the risk associated with price changes has been eliminated. I can concentrate on being an airline rather than worrying about the price of fuel, okay? Any questions about that? So that is in principle why, um, why there are commodities markets and why there are futures markets. Any questions? And again, what would affect the prices of commodities? Okay? They would be affected by news, okay, okay, that will change this, that will affect supply and demand for it. If demand for the commodity is going to go up, the future price should go up. If the supply is going to go up, the future price should go down, right? Again, as we, you know, in the last couple of days, oil futures had gone up very high suddenly and then dropped dramatically a few days ago, at least in the United States. You know why? Because of the hurricane. There was a hurricane passing through that the people were afraid was going to take out some offshore oil platforms. If the hurricane struck the platform, what would happen? There would be less oil produced, lower supply, prices would go up, right? As soon as the hurricane missed the platforms, the future price went down because that risk had gone away, okay? Any questions? So this is what the commodity markets do, okay? Any questions? They factor in changes as a fu function of weather, political changes, and economic forces, things like that. Any questions? Another type of financial market that is very important is the currency market, the foreign exchange market. In fact, my understanding is if you look at the amount of money that trades hands in all the financial markets, there's commodity markets, there's stock markets, there's currency exchange markets. In fact, the largest amount of money that changes hands every day is in the currency exchange markets by a large amount, okay? This is where people trade values between dollars and some other currency, euros, yen, you know, uh, you know, won, whatever uh, is traded on a currency exchange, okay? How is it that people trade currencies, at least currently, okay? You've seen this if you've ever gone to an airport and visited another country you see an exchange window, right? And what happens at an exchange window? I walk in there, they will have a price 
where they will say that they will buy dollars and convert them to yen or buy yen and convert it to dollars. If that price for buying and selling was the same, the person would make no difference, no value, right? So if, let's say, I agreed that, uh, again, one dollar equals a hundred yen, and I agree that one yen equals one over a hundred dollars, Then, trading back and forth, every time you wanted yen, I'd give you dollars back and forth. I don't make any profit on this. Does that make sense? So the way that you have to do it is you specify a gap between what the exchange is that I will give you, how many yen I will give you, instead of giving you 100 yen for the dollar. If you want yen, maybe I will give you 99 yen for a dollar. And instead of giving you one one-hundredth of a dollar, for a yen. Maybe I'll give you one over a hundred and second of a dollar. Okay? And this gap is where currency traders make their money in some sense from the spread of these prices. Does that make sense? Now can they, what would cause this spread to change? Why might over time, the price, the relative value of dollars and yen, why might they change? Okay? What would be the fundamental reason why they might change? Okay? The biggest reason would be supply and demand, at least the most immediate reason. If somebody comes along to this dealer and says, I want to change dollars to yen, dollars to yen, dollars to yen, what is going to happen to that person? They're eventually going to run out of yen. Does that make sense? If I'm going to be trading currencies back and forth, I can only do this if the amount of dollars coming into me is equal to the amount of yen coming into me. The flow of, of the money products have to be equal. Is that right? And if there is too much money on one side, then the prices have to shift. Does that make sense? Okay? And so the fundamental thing that really is happening in the currency, again, it's a supply and demand market. Okay? And that the spread and the prices, the spread is sort of my, my profit here. How big a spread I can get depends upon how much competition I have. Does that make sense? When you go, if, if I am sitting here, I have to catch a plane and I have to buy the ticket in the end. Okay? And all I have is dollars, and you're sitting there. I'm desperate to get yen, right? Would you give me a big spread or a little spread? You take advantage of me and, give, and, and charge me a lot for my yen. Does that make sense? You can only do that provided there isn't somebody next to you who's competing for my business. Does that make sense? So the spread is in some sense equal to the amount of a function of the competition. The prices on these things are a function of supply and demand. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, why are currency markets... Any questions about currency markets? We're talking a little bit much now. So why are currency markets good things? Why do they exist? Okay. One reason is the reason why I needed a currency market when I came to Hong Kong. I had dollars, I needed yen, okay? So these markets enable me to uh, acquire money for trade. That is one thing. Another thing that I could do with it is hedge against currency fluctuations. Let's say that I am going to about to cut a deal, okay, with somebody where I need to have a lot of dollars a year from now, and all I have are yen. I might be worried about, I may live, live in a yen world. I need dollars at a certain time. I know how much the price of those dollars is now. But strange things might happen in the world. It might be that by buying yen in the future, buying a future market in yen somehow, saying that I will, want to, I will agree to convert my money a year from now, 
if I price that now, I can hedge myself against changes that might happen from here to now. I will reduce risks of currency changes. Okay? And that's a valuable thing about a currency market. And finally, I can speculate, okay, on future events. If I think that something bad is going to happen to the United States, and the United States is going to be less likely to pay its bills, okay, the people are likely to be less happy about taking U.S. dollars, I may want to have another currency, okay? And to speculate on that, I can also use the currency markets for it. Any questions? Now what's interesting though, as we'll talk about a little bit later, is that the relative prices between dollars and yen, or any pair of currencies, there actually is a, a right price for, for the relative values of these, these currencies. It's not just, I think the United States is dumping, okay? This actually is a right reason, and it's going to depend upon interest rates. How much interest do you earn on money in the United States versus how much money you earn on interest in the, uh, the, the other country? If banks pay a lot of interest in Japan, okay, are yen worth more or less? More, right? I'd love to have yen because I can put it in a bank there and get a lot of interest on it, right? So in fact, the relative prices of currencies are going to depend upon interest rates. But we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. Any questions about financial currency markets, why they operate like that? Any questions about currency? Okay, good. So, in all of these markets, I will claim that there are three types of investors. Okay, and um, we, 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 we um, you know, it's important to sort of understand what these three types of investors are and where we in this class are going to be most interested in. Okay? Um, speculators, I've used that word, are people who are betting on future events. When you go to a horse racing track, okay, and you put your money on um, Alpo, okay, to win, you are speculating on the future of that horse. Is that a, does everybody agree with that? You are trying to predict the future, and if you think you know how to predict the future, you can make a lot of money. That's sort of what a speculator does. <coughs> a hedger is an investor who is trying to reduce their risk. Okay? Where I'm going to pay things, I don't necessarily expect to make a profit from it. Okay? I don't even want to make a profit from it. Okay? But I am trying to reduce my risk. Okay? So, for example, if I buy a stock, okay, I have a risk that it will go down, right? If I short a stock, where I'm betting for it to go down, I have a risk it will go up. If I buy the stock and short it, okay, what is my risk? Okay, if the stock goes up, I am happy to own it. I gain a certain amount because I owned it, and I lose a certain, an equal amount because I shorted it. Does that make sense? So in principle, if I own two of these investments, I have actually reduced my risk. You may say it's a pointless exercise. Why did I buy them in the first place? But you see how I might buy investments with the property of reducing risk. Okay? Are there any investments that you guys will buy over your life to reduce risk? Okay, what? Insurance is the classic example, right? You don't buy insurance with the hope of making a profit on it, right? You are hoping, in fact, to lose money on every time you buy, buy health insurance, or life insurance, for goodness sake. I am hoping I'm going to lose every dollar I put into life insurance, right? But the risk of my financial, you know, basically our financial position is less risky. Because we know that if my salary plunges because I'm dead, the insurance kicks in. Okay? Any questions? Now, the third kind of a investor is the most interesting to us. Okay? And it is called an arbitrager. Okay? An arbitrager 
is somebody who's looking to take advantage when two things are inconsistently priced. Okay? They're looking to take advantage. They're, they're looking at the prices that you can get for all kinds of securities out there, stocks and futures and currencies and all these kind of things. And desperately looking for a situation where they can guarantee themselves a profit by exploiting the fact that some people may be, things may be mispriced. Okay? What would be an example of that? Maybe a, maybe a simple example of that is in the currency market. Suppose, let's say, that um, I have one dealer here who will let me convert dollars into yen at a hundred dollar at a uh, hundred yen per dollar okay and I have somebody else okay who will let me convert um, one yen into um, let's say uh, you know uh, what would it say say point zero two dollars okay suppose I have this situation where one guy is very happy for me to will, will, will give me a hundred yen for a dollar and somebody else will give me two cents for each yen what should I do okay what would be a good thing for me to do if I happen to hit this situation I, one thing that would be great would be for me to borrow a huge amount of money from the bank. Say, so give me some money from the bank. And I will then go and take those dollars from the bank and buy a lot of yen. Okay, you give me a million dollars from the bank. I will go buy a hundred million yen. Right? I will now go and um, sell those hundred million yen to get back how much? Two, two million dollars? Then pay the one million dollars to the bank. What? Well, okay. Then maybe I keep doing this, and I keep doing this until the prices change. Is that right? The prices don't change. You're right. I have nothing to do in the rest of my life but make money. More likely, this guy's going to run out of money pretty fast and stop offering me that deal, right? So an arbitrager is right now hunting around desperately for things that they can do that will have no risk to them, but guarantee them a profit because things are mispriced. Okay? This is actually a good example. We're going to look at other examples, but I think this is a good case that everybody should understand. Everybody agree with that? If the prices are inconsistent and I can borrow money, I can profit from this. What if the prices are inconsistent that I can't borrow money? Okay? Then I can't take advantage of it. Does everybody agree with that? Okay, so the ability to borrow money is an important thing. Unless I have money, that's fine. None of you have money, we just to verify this. Okay? I have enough money to, to make much difference here, right? Okay? But so an arbitrager is looking for things that are mispriced. Okay? And that's why the ability to price what things should be. Okay? Okay? Really what the price of these complicated things are is what governs all the mathematics and all the computational finance business. Okay? Because if I know what the prices of things really are, I can lock in profits through this kind of an idea of arbitrage. And this idea is going to be very important to us. Any questions about what arbitrage is? Okay. Most of you have been used to the idea of speculators. I don't know what's going to I think Google's going to do well. I'll buy Google. Okay. Note that the other reasons for investing have nothing to do with trying to predict the future. Okay. Any questions? Okay. That said, let's talk, start to talk um, briefly about... Um, so any questions about the markets that we have so far? I'm happy to keep talking about it. Ten more minutes. And so I'm either going to go on to derivatives or if there's any questions about either the commodities market or stock market or currency markets, any of these things. Okay? So once.
twice. Okay. So derivatives are another class of financial instruments that are more complicated than what we've talked about before. We've talked about bonds, okay? We've talked about currency futures. We've talked about currency transactions. We've talked about stocks. Derivatives are financial instruments, okay, whose value derives from other values, okay? So the classic, let's say, derivatives that we people talk about are options and futures, but mostly options, okay? Or not and mostly, let's talk about options. An option is a security that gives me the right, but not the obligation, okay, to buy or sell something at a specified price, okay? Now, um, when we talked about bonds, when we talked about mortgages, there is no degree of discretion involved with that, right? I made an agreement when I took out a mortgage. I made an agreement to pay the bank, right? What happens if I go to the bank and say, I don't feel like paying you this month? Okay, the bank doesn't take that, does it? Right? An option is going to give me the right to do something, but not the obligation. Okay? Okay, so let's look at an example. If I were to sort of draw a picture of it. Suppose, let's say, I have an option to buy Google, a share of Google at $500, okay? I can draw a graph as to what the value of that option is. Suppose right now you're giving me an option to buy Google from you, a share of Google from you at $500. What is that worth right now, okay? What does it depend on? What the price of Google is actually out there, right? Let's say this is the current value of Google. Suppose you give me the option to buy a price, to sell, you, you, you're saying you can buy a share of Google from me for $500. And Google is right now selling for $500. What is that offer worth to me? What is that option to buy it from you for $500 worth? Nothing. Think about this. Say this again. I don't know if people have caught this thing. You are making me the generous offer to sell me a share of Google for $500. How much should I pay for this offer? How much should I value this offer? If Google is right now at $500, the value of that op offer should be zero, right? Because I, if I want a, pair of, a, a stock of a share of Google, I can pay $500 from somebody else, right? But what if the price of Google is $600? What is his offer to sell it to me for $500 worth? $100. Does everybody agree with that? So if this is, let's say, a graph of the value, this is going to show me the value of the op value of the option. Right now we're talking about an immediate execution type of thing, right? As a function of the strike price, if the current spot price is the same as what we would call the strikes price, the specified price for the option, the option itself is worth nothing. Does everybody agree with that? If the option is worth, if the strike price is, uh, is the strike price here is K, if the spot price here is S, the value of this option at this point is S minus K. Does everybody agree with that? What is the option to buy Google worth at $500? if Google is selling for $400. What is that option worth? It is worth zero. It is not worth a negative amount, right? If I paid $500 for Google, okay, then the fact that it's now selling at $400, I'm down 100 right? If 
But the option has the value of in some sense with the following shape to it. Okay? That below the strike price in principle, it is worth nothing. It's if the option has to be executed now. Above the strike price, okay? Okay, it's the spot price minus the strike the the, 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 the spot price minus the strike strike price. In principle, really what it is, is it is equal to the maximum of 0 and S minus K. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? So options give me the right to trade these things. Futures contracts give me both the right and the obligation to buy or sell, to sell something, buy or sell something at a given price at a particular time. So futures contracts make sense if, let's say, I needed those pork bellies, right? If I have a contract to buy pork bellies from someone, okay, at a particular time, this contract, I, I, I am guaranteeing that I will buy them, okay? I have both the right to buy them at a particular price and an obligation to buy them. You see what the difference is between an option and a futures contract? Okay? So, um, you know, in principle, it never hurts to own an option. If you're willing to give me an option, I will take whatever option you will give me. Because the value of it can't be zero, right? If you give me a futures contract to deliver 5,000 pork bellies a year from now, at $36 per pork belly. That I can lose something on because I have an obligation to buy those pork bellies, okay, regardless of what the price is. So the values of these things can be negative. Any questions? Okay. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail. Okay, any questions about options? Okay, only a couple minutes here. Um, When we talk about these contracts, okay, let's, 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 let's basically say it again. When we talk about forward contracts, these are going to be something that's sort of a little bit simpler than futures, okay? A forward contract is a um, uh, agreement, uh, but, but, uh, to, to, is, a, is an agreement to buy or sell something at a specified price on or before a specified date, okay? When you buy any of these securities, okay, there are notions of long and short positions, okay? And maybe, uh, I'm just going to say it now and then maybe we'll, we'll talk about this again next time, okay? A long position on a contract agrees to buy something, okay? So if, let's say I have a forward contract to buy Microsoft, Okay? I will agree to buy it on a particular day. Okay? I am considered as going long. Because if I agree to buy something a year from now at a price, I am hoping it will go up. The short position means I agree to sell something on a particular date. If I am going to agree to sell you something at a particular price in the future, I am hoping it will go down. Okay? And so there's sort of this notion of long and short positions. And we'll use that lingo again, you know, when we talk about these things more carefully. Any questions? So next class, we'll start we'll talk a little bit more about, we'll start talking about more seriously about options and how do you price them. Any questions right now? Okay, so everybody hopefully has at least once signed the uh, class roster. Okay, is the roster circulating around? Has anybody seen that? Okay, good. Make sure I get that. Um, if you have any questions, come back and talk to me after class. If not, see you guys next Tuesday. Thank you.